Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today as we chat about disability and accessibility services for veterans in higher education. We are Services School, a nonprofit organization helping veterans and transitioning service members with college admissions by providing peer to peer mentorship, counseling, resources, and so much more completely free. Today, we are joined by Hira, an admissions colleague from Amherst College, which is one of our VetLink partner schools. She's here today to chat with you all about not only the possible, possible uh, disability services that may be available, but the impacts those have, and again, so much more. Um, just a few items to touch on before I hand it over. We will do a Q&A at the end of the presentation that um, here is put together for us. And we would like to encourage anybody to use the chat feature to put any questions that come up along the presentation so you don't forget those and we'll address all of them at the end. This is also being recorded so the recording will be sent out along with a handout to everybody after the event. If you have any questions, let me know. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Hira and get started. Wonderful. Thank you, Services School, for having me today. Um, as shared, my name is Hira Byrne. I'm with Amherst College, and I'm looking forward to talking to you all about disability and accessibility services in higher ed. Um, let me just figure out my little, why is it not? There we go. Technology. You'd think I'd have it by now in this virtual space, but here we go. A uh, little bit about me. I am a higher education and disability professional. As shared, I am an Assistant Dean of Admission here at Amherst College. I'm also a grant project specialist for uh, veterans programs at Deaf Tech out of Rochester Institute of Technology and the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. That's a long one. I am also a certified rehabilitation counselor and I've been working in the veteran transition space now for over a decade. So I'm really excited to talk to you about some benefits that you may not be aware of. Um, so before I get too far into things, Amherst College is a VetLink partner. We are very proud to be one. Uh, we are a small, national, highly selective liberal arts college located in Amherst, Massachusetts, small being 17 to 1800 students, national. Um, we have students from, I think, about 68 countries right now, 48 of the states. Um, so a lot of diversity on our campus there. Um, highly selective, we have about a 7 to 8% admit rate. Liberal arts, we are looking at transferable uh, knowledge for any career industry focused on uh, more of the communication skills, research, analytics, um, and all of those wonderful things. And at college, uh, we are residential um, and undergrad only. Um, we are a yellow ribbon institution, and right now we have no cap on the number of veterans that can uh, qualify for yellow ribbon, and we also have no cap on uh, the amount that you can receive. So interested in Amherst, I did put some QR codes here. You'll also see them throughout the presentation. Um, so feel free to scan as we go along. And at the end, I do have a slide with all the links in case there are any issues with any of the QR codes. So uh, let's jump into the content now. We're here to really talk about translating that VA rating into benefits for you in the higher education space. One of the things that is really critical, I think, for veterans to understand and know is that your VA rating is more than compensation. Um, it's often most talked about in terms of that monetary value, but really what that monetary value is, is your rating percentage is equal to the functional impacts of your disability. So per the VA, um, we assign you a disability rating based on the severity of your disability. We express this rating as a percentage representing how much your disability decreases your overall health and ability to function. So what they're really trying to do is compensate you for the potential loss in income because of these functional impacts. So when you think of your VA rating, it is more than money. It is, again, equating to these functional impacts, which is what I'm going to be talking about a lot throughout today's presentation. So service-connected benefits as a whole. It's really understand, important to understand your rating. Again, not just the percentage, but what are the, the other components to it? Um, you will be eligible for certain disability-related benefits from the federal government. Um, I do have a QR code here to take you to the Service Connected Matrix that gives you some of what you'll be qualified for. Uh, again, if you're like, 
10% to 100. Um, you get the many of you have heard of this, the 10 point preference for federal hiring. Um, there's no cost for healthcare and prescription meds. Uh, you qualify for veteran readiness and employment, which I'll talk about later in this um, presentation. And then it talks about, you know, if you're 30% or above or 90% and above. Um, so just understanding, again, not just what you're gonna get um, in terms of the money value, but these other benefits that are tied to the specific percentage of your rating. And that's within the VA system. There are other federal benefits too relating to your percentage and maybe the amount of federal taxes you pay. I don't know if any of you know about that. Um, but then in addition to the federal benefits, it's really critical to understand that there are also state level benefits um, tied to your uh, disability status and sometimes also tied to your specific VA rating level. So it's important too to consider which state you're residing in and looking into what additional benefits they offer. This includes different types of tax breaks, different benefits for home ownership and potentially renovations to homes, um, you know, discounts on, on license plates and all sorts of things. So make sure not to focus solely on the VA uh, benefits and the federal benefits, but also looking for those state level benefits as you think about your rating. And again, your rating is a representation of a disability status. So please ensure that you're also looking at just general benefits for persons with disabilities in your area. All right, so let's tie in some of that functional impacts and going back to what do I mean by what they're rating you for? So the uh, functional impacts of disability are really the ways in which your disability may change, alter, or limit how you function. And we're talking daily life, your school and learning, um, and your work. And daily life includes your social pieces. So please remember that as well. Um, these functional impacts will vary from individual to individual, um, but they do have commonalities. So you and your buddy may both have chronic back pain, um, but again, the way it impacts you may be very different. So, uh, you know, it's okay to have those differences as you're kind of comparing notes with friends, um, but just be aware of that are, there are those kind of common themes that you'll see providers talk about. You'll see them generalized as people talk about disability, stuff like this. And the v, VA will often kind of do those broad umbrella commonalities. These functional impacts, it's important to remember that they can be immediate. Like, you know, right away, yep, I live with chronic pain and that is not going away. Um, some of it can be progressive and ongoing as well. So being aware of how your body is feeling or your disabilities are changing over time, again, aging, changes a lot for every individual. Um, and so just being aware of that um, and thinking about wh what you were rated for as you originally separated. And then if there's a progression and change in that uh, functioning and that disability, think about if you need to um, perhaps go in and refile and get your rating updated. So consider that as you're feeling how you're adjusting to what's gone on. Also being aware too, what can impact the functioning is the setting you're in, the demand you're putting on your body um, and mind and all of those pieces. And again, the existing accommodations. So you might be doing well in one setting, then you shift to another and you're thinking, my gosh, it wasn't this hard before. And that can be some of that influence. Knowing how to talk about these functional impacts and thinking about what's changing, what's going on, it's important so that you can be your own self-advocate. And this is in your healthcare. This is if you're getting ready to transition out and getting ready for what those comprehensive exams, the CMP exams they often talk about in the rating process, you're gonna get evaluated. You're gonna to wanna to be able to talk to your provider and say, I don't just have these symptoms, I have these impacts to what I'm trying to do day in and day out. Because remember, that's what they're really rating you on. Um, and thinking about the daily functioning, the learning, the work, and then in it, that extension of where may this play into effect in terms of workplace or educational accommodations. I'll talk a little bit more of that difference between symptoms and functional impacts as we talk about actual um, accommodations that you may be eligible for. So moving into this space of higher ed, as you're entering the learning environment, um, again, this is maybe one of those times where you'll find that change. This wasn't impacting me before, but now I've changed settings and I think my service-connected disabilities may be impacting me in a different way. So there are all these, there are these things called accommodations. Now in the 
military, I know that it's often referring to your housing, um, in the higher ed space and disability wor world, accommodations uh, really refers to the services, items, or adjustments made so that a person has equal access to environments, so physical spaces, um, information, anything you're supposed to be learning or understanding, and then task completion. So again, in school, this is, you know, your assignments and things like that. In your work, it's, you know, completing whatever task you have to do to do your job. In higher ed, and technically in the workplace as well, you are expected to be your own advocate and to know what you need for accommodations. Um, so this can be challenging sometimes for veterans who are still adjusting to their uh, disabilities and saying, well, I don't really know how it's impacting me and I have no idea what it would even be a possibility for me to have as an accommodation. Um, so I'm gonna be providing you a resource later on on how to kind of start educating yourself on um, the accommodations you may need and the impacts your disability may be having. It is important to know that you must be the one to request the accommodations. Um, they are not automatically granted no matter what space you're in, whether that's higher ed or work. Um, this is, you know, just because you're rated doesn't mean you're automatically going to, it's going to translate to your school or they're going to say, oh yeah, you're a 20% disabled vet, so you automatically are going to get XYZ. Um, this is, again, because sometimes people will have disabilities that don't necessarily cause large functional impacts where they would need the accommodation. Just to be aware of it, how to request them, what kind of departments you're looking for if you've never sought this out before. In higher ed, it's usually the Office for Students with Disabilities, the Disability Office. Also, many schools are switching to the term Accessibility Offices. Um, they maybe the 504 ADA coordinator. So using any of those words will help you find it. Typically, if you say, I'm looking for the office that provides accommodations, they'll be able to direct you. On the flip side too, in the workplace, it's usually human resources, the 504 ADA coordinator or the um, EEO office, equal employment opportunity. So just to kind of help orient you, if you're thinking you may need these things, I want you to know kind of where to go to get that information. All right. So the purpose of the academic accommodations is really to provide you equal access to learning and the campus environment as a whole. So again, going back to these accommodations, it's environment, it's information, and it's task completion. So when you think of accommodations, you want to think not just what do I need in the classroom, but what do I need to be an equal member of the campus community? Um, especially if you're going to be on a really large campus, if you have any type of mobility, physical disability, you wanna have that consideration of how the heck am I gonna get from class to class to begin with, right? So when you think of accommodations, don't just think in terms of what do I need to learn, but also how do I navigate the space that I'm in? Um, it is important too, to note that there are limitations to academic accommodations. Uh, they cannot provide any undue advantage to you. In other words, you are held to the same standards and par as any other student. And then additionally, they can't fundamentally alter any course curriculums. Um, this can include assignments. So you, again, must complete all components of a course. So it's just important for students to know that that is uh, part of the accommodation process. I do have the QR code here for the Job Accommodation Network. Um, I think it's a really great site, especially for those who are still learning their disabilities. What it does is it will, this particular code will bring you to the landing page for the A to Z disabilities. This particular page will have all the disability categories that they have um, listed and you can click on them and from there they'll talk about some of the functional impacts that you may be having and then also on the flip side some accommodations that may be beneficial. This page I think is very great for people to kind of understand where they're at and also where things may progress to also kind of put that in the, you know, in the back of the mind of like, okay, I need to remember that this may happen. And if it does, this could be disability related. Um, and then again, what's critical here too, is they'll recommend some common accommodations um, that may apply for this particular condition. And again, those are the pieces of information that you need to have as you go forward to work with the disability professionals. Um, I'm going to see... Well, when we uh, end this, I will try and pull up the page and show you some specific examples if that would be helpful. So if you're thinking that maybe you would benefit from the academic accommodations, 
Um, just again, remember they're provided through campus, a, a campus disability office and know that all the information you share with the disability professional and the office itself is confidential. So the specifics of your service-connected disabilities, non-service-connected disabilities, any detailed documentation, any sharing in conversation, it remains confidential. Uh, your faculty members that are instructors will never know your, the specifics to your disability unless you disclose them. So I just want to make sure everyone knows that these are safe offices to go to and disclose information. Um, the typical process, just so you know, there are a series of steps usually beginning these services. You, most departments will have a, an application that you'll complete. You do have to submit documentation of your disability. This does need to come from a professional medical provider. This is you know, your VA rating information, VA medical records, military medical records, and any private records as well. Because I know sometimes people do seek um, diagnosis and care outside of the military setting. So just know that you can also provide those. Um, typically, too, you're going to have to do some type of intake or welcome appointment. You discuss your disabilities, you discuss the courses that you're taking, um, and the barriers to learning or the campus environment. The reason you're going to have this discussion is because every, again, we talked about that changing environment can lead to different um, impacts. So every semester, as you change courses, you may find that you encounter new functional uh, limitations or changes. So that's where it becomes critical to talk with the professionals to figure out, hey, what else might I need? Um, and so just know too that the accommodations are fluid. You can change them and update them as things go on, semesters change, needs change. Once you're a part of the disability services, it is up to you, the student, to disclose to your faculty members that you wanna use accommodations. This is a really critical point, going back to that confidentiality piece. Your school won't disclose that you're a student of theirs using that department and they won't notify your faculty, it is on you, the student, to go and inform your faculty. Um, and again, some students will notify certain instructors, not others. Again, you may not even need accommodations for every class. So just understand that just because you finish the process of developing your accommodations, they don't really kick into effect until you have notified your faculty. So let's talk accommodations themselves for a little bit. Um, let me see here. So I was going to do the, you know, reactions. I don't want to make people uncomfortable. So I'll do more broad pieces, but these are some examples of standard academic accommodations that students may be eligible for. Again, you're going to get paired with what are your disabilities? What are their functional impacts? And what are the classes you're in and the requirements of the class? And how does it all pair together in terms of how do these accommodations get selected? But very common is extended test time or quiz time, distraction reduced setting for taking quizzes and tests, breaks as needed, um, preferential seating, peer note takers, closed captioning for audio material and accessible equipment for the classroom. And so you might be wondering like, what is extended testing quiz time? How does that work in the distraction reduced setting? So for some people who, if you have PTSD, if you have anxiety, um, you may find it harder to concentrate. You may lose your train of thought. Um, some people also with PTSD experience some memory fog. Um, if you have a TBI or ABI, um, which is a traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury, um, it may actually take you longer to process information, both what you're reading and then also your output of what you're producing. So if you have a very short amount of time to get the information out, and that's gonna work against you in terms of a functional limitation of what your disabilities are, that's where an extended test time might be beneficial. In addition, I have also seen with the students uh, in my previous roles, I've, for students who have a lot of chronic pain, um, people who maybe can't sit for more than, let's say 30 minutes at a time, um, they need to get up, they need to stretch and, and move around and then sit back down and continue working. Anytime you're getting up and getting away from the chair, you might be losing time to do your exam. So again, that extended time allows you to um, make sure you have ample time to complete the expected task. Um, again, the breaks as needed from class, that plays for many different um, conditions and that maybe you may have a chronic health condition where you actually need to go to the bathroom more often. Um, again, depending on chronic pain, um, you may need to step out and stretch and you don't wanna do that 
you know, in the back of the room where everyone can see you. Um, also, again, for any anxiety, um, sometimes if you need to remove yourself. Preferential seating. Some people, if um, you maybe have hearing loss and tinnitus, is another very common disability in the military population. I know my husband has that from being in the wing and, and a tanker. <laughs> um, so he needs to be where pe- he can see somebody's face, right? And he does a lot of lip reading. So maybe you prefer the front of the class so you can see as the instructor's talking. Other people may need the back of the room. Again, if you're going to be standing up a lot, you don't want to be disrupting your classmates. You take the back of the room. And again, sometimes it's just what side of the room. So there's preferential seating. And if you think about maybe you're stepping away from your desk a lot because of these other things we've mentioned earlier, the chronic pain, the um, needing the bathroom more often, whatever it is, sometimes it's helpful to have pure note takers too. People who are going to help make sure that if you aren't there writing, you're not missing the critical information that's getting put out there. Um, again, going back to the hearing loss and tinnitus, uh, closed captioning is a very vital piece. Um, also, for certain hearing loss and tinnitus too, it can be tone related. So it doesn't matter how fast or slow somebody is talking, it's literally the tone and you know octave of their voice makes it harder to hear. So that's where closed captioning can be helpful. I mentioned this one too, in particular for anybody who's doing distance learning and maybe there's a lot of Zoom uh, classroom uh, happening. The other piece is accessible uh, equipment for the classroom. You might need a standing desk, right? You need to make sure there's a lab table that can go up and down. Uh, maybe because of uh, you know a leg injury, you can't stand for long periods of time. And in the lab room where you're supposed to be standing at a lab desk for you know an hour, potentially three hours, labs can be really long. You're like, I can't do that. So you get a desk that is lower, either a varying desk or they make sure there's one that's a sitting at sitting level so you have it. So this also sometimes turns into ergonomic chairs or, or a different chair for the classroom to make sure it's not aggravating any back pain or um, pinching of nerves or things of that nature. So these academic accommodations, again, this is just a short list. There are a lot of different accommodations out there and I encourage you to explore that job accommodation network to kind of see what's out there in terms of uh, accommodations that you might be interested in. And again, you may test an accommodation and say, that really didn't do much for me and that's okay. What I encourage you to do is go back to um, your counselor and say, this one didn't work, but I think I, I think I still need something. Can we look into something else? Again, remember they're fluid and you can change them as you need. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're thinking about what you need. And again, as your classes change, you may find that you need different um, accommodations as, as you enter different classes. Vocational rehab is one of the pieces I, I really want to talk about in terms of students, student veterans who may benefit from those academic accommodations that I'm talking about. And then also in addition, if, no, if there are anyone in attendance who doesn't know much about vocational rehabilitation. So vocational rehabilitation is technically an employment program. I know in the military community, a lot of times it gets talked about as an education program. But vocational rehabilitation, or VR, as I'm going to refer to it, is an employment program that supports persons with significant barriers to employment to uh, gaining competitive employment. This, again, will uh, have an interactive counseling process where you're going to work with a counselor and talk to them about your disabilities and those functional (laughs) impacts again. Um, And then you and your counselor will develop an employment plan um, based on your career goal. Kind of like the um, accommodations we were just talking about, services to kind of expect in the VR space are based on your employment goal. So it may be some or all of these. And this includes the aspects of employment searching, such as job searching, resume writing, interview prep, things along nature. Um, Sometimes too, it's more you just need some on-the-job training, maybe internships and apprenticeships to get some hands-on learning. And then in some cases, it does require education, formal education and training that's more kind of long term. This can be certificate programs, associate bachelor's, master levels, and it can be doc programs as well. But again, these always have to be um, required and tied to the job and career industry of of interest. Um, And so, as I mentioned earlier, many of you have probably heard of a vocational program. Um, So the federal version of this is VRNE, 
um, for short, it's a veteran readiness and employment program. Um, you must be at least 10% service connected to rate eligibility for it. Um, and then just so you know, there's also state and local rehabilitation programs. So many veterans find that actually they don't qualify for VRNE or they don't like the outcomes that VRNE is you know, working with them on. And so just know that there's another office you can seek and work with. And this is just any person with a documented disability that has that significant barrier to employment. And again, this is where looking at your VA rating beyond its VA identity and that you technically qualify as a person with a disability and there are other programs and services you may be eligible for beyond the VA setting. So these links, um, the first one we'll talk about, you know, what is the VRNE program? And then the second link here um, talks about different state and uh, VR programs. You know what, again, each state kind of has a different name for their VR program. So I just want to make sure people know how to go find the one for the state that they are in. So VRNE is often referred to as Chapter 31. So if you are a Chapter 31 veteran already, um, this is again where if you rate VRNE and you're going and using it, you probably then also would maybe benefit from those academic accommodations I spoke about earlier. Um, remember, it is an employment program first. They will help pay for the education um, if it ties to your career outcomes. And again, this is a program focused on those functional limitations and those service-connected disabilities. There are technically five tracks to the VRNE program. Um, they are reemployment, which if you return to your former job and work with them, and the VRNE will help work with the employer to address your needs. Sometimes this is people returning, honestly, as contract civilian contractors um, in the space that they were in prior in the military and things like that. There's the rapid, rapid access to employment, which is finding a new job or career that builds on your ex existing skills and education. So sometimes kind of going back to it, this is where maybe you just need a quick certification, maybe you just need some on-the-job training, but you really have the skills and knowledge to go hit the workforce pretty quickly. Um, there is self-employment tracks for those who are thinking of being an entrepreneur. That word always trips me up. Um, and then there's employment through long-term services. And this is typically the track for people on education. It means you're gonna be a part of the VRNE program longer because you're gonna be going to school. Um, again, if they're going to pay for education, you really need to tie it into, I need to get this degree because these jobs require this level of education. Even though I have a lot of experience, I don't have the formal education, maybe that is required for the positions. So there is a way to talk to um, VRNE professionals, again, not only about the functional impacts of your disability, but why that may be influencing you changing your career field, and in turn, the education you then need to get into said career field. The final track is independent living, and this is for those who may have a delayed return to work, if you have a very significant disability that's gonna take some recovery time. Um, and then also there are those who do not um, return to work. And so you may just need assistance on how to live independently and VRNE also assists with that. Some additional um, educational benefits that I do wanna highlight um, in addition to the chapter 31 benefit on VRNE um, in terms of, again, if you manage to connect your education to your employment goal is there is a chapter 35 benefit or the survivor dependent benefit. So going again, back down to your rating, if you're hundred percent permanent and total disabled, um, or, you know, for anyone who is a person AK or MIA or died because of the service connected disabilities, family members um, do qualify for this chapter 35, which will provide education and training, money for tuition, money for housing, and money for books and supplies. And again, maybe this is an information you need that maybe a buddy does, so this is also why I include it. And all of this information here is really for you in attendance and anybody you know in your personal network. So just um, for family members to be aware that there is this additional benefit if you're 100% permanent in total or these other um, situations, then we want to make sure the family members are also supported in this. For you, the service member, um, something that not everyone knows about is if you are 100% permanent and total um, disabled, then you will be eligible for federal loan forgiveness. 
This means your loans, student loans for any degree tier can be forgiven. Um, this is a big caution, warning sign, blinking lights, pay attention. If you are enrolled in an academic program and you are 100% PNT and you have loans, the school you are enrolled in will be notified by the VA that you qualify for loan forgiveness. You must watch for a letter coming to you asking if you'd like to defer your loans to be forgiven. And if you do not respond to this letter, they will immediately forgive your loans. This can be challenging if you're still in the process of getting your degree and you may need more loans to finish it out. Um, because forgiving more than one loan in a three-year period may cause changes to the previously forgiven loans. So if you are 100% PNT, you are enrolled, and you do have loans, it's really critical to talk to your school and loan holder um, about, hey, I don't want to have these forgiven until I'm completely done. And then again, um, really be on the watch for any communication from your loan holder and the VA about that loan forgiveness. More information for that, again, can be found on the web page associated with the QR code here. Lastly, I do want to leave some additional resources with you. Um, the first and foremost is these higher education accommodation resources. Again, remembering now, if you are a veteran who has been rated as service connected, um, you fall under the protections of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, if you have significant um, barriers to employment and social interactions and learning and all of these aspects of life, you fall under this protection. And I think it's important for veterans to realize that again, outside of the VA, there are these other entities and protections and laws that are in place outside of your veteran status that you can take advantage of and make sure you know what you're eligible for. So the Americans with Disabilities do have two links here um, talking about kind of what are your rights as a student with a disability, not a veteran with a disability, but just in general, a student um, uh, with disabilities. Also, the Department of Ed has provided some information as well, specifically, um, again, talking to the student experience. Um, in particular, they do have some examples of possible accommodations. And I think what's also important for that first link is understanding um, disability and disclosure of disability and your rights. So again, if you're developing those self-advocacy skills on how do I even talk about these things, these are resources for you um, to develop that. I didn't really talk as much about this um, because again, we're focusing on higher ed here, um, but there are also important information to know about when you think about, hey, you're going to school because you're gonna land a job, right? You're entering a new career field. So um, thinking about where this may translate into workplace accommodations as well. So again, the ADA has many wonderful resources about what are workplace accommodations? How do they go about them? What, how do you ask them of your employers and things like that? In addition, Paralyzed Veterans of America, also known as PVA, um, has a veterans career program. And so they provide a lot of wonderful information and training on um, what does it mean to be a service-connected veteran, how do you navigate the employment space, and also the education space. And then, of course, the Department of Labor also, um, again, thinking about those big umbrellas that you fall under now. Um, as a person with disabilities in the, in the workforce, they do have a link there for um, specifically veterans and understanding um, your rights. So I'm gonna leave it there for now. Um, I wanna leave time for any questions. Uh, and I do have my contact information here. I have my email, uh, phone number, again, the website to Amherst College. I do have my LinkedIn page too, if you'd like to connect. Uh, via LinkedIn. And I do have my QR code here for my Calendarly link. If you'd like to talk one-on-one -on -one, um, about your own specific situation, I am more than happy to do so. Um, and again, whether you come to Amherst or not, or I am here as a resource um, to support any academic journey and any um, disability journey. So please don't hesitate to reach out at any point in time if you have any questions or concerns that I could assist you with. As mentioned, I do have a list of the QR codes. I'll leave this here for just a short second in case anyone wants to take a screenshot. Um, but again, I know Services School will be sending out a PDF of all of this. Um, so you'll be able to access all these links um, after the fact. But I'll go back to here. 
and I will stop sharing, bring it back to the big room. That was awesome, Hera. Um, we had one question through the Q&A so far that I think you already addressed by my assumption. Um, it was asking you to talk about the permanent total disability discharge program, specifically access to federal loan discharging for 100% P&T disabled vets who have used their entire GI Bill on their undergrad and going to grad school. Um, Yes, that's a great question. And that was definitely why I bring up the loan forgiveness because that does happen a lot where veterans will use up their 911 or they've given it to their families and they're like, oh wait, I wanna go back to school now, what do I do? Um, so if you do take out student loans and you are 100% P&T, definitely look into the loan forgiveness program. Again, with that big caution sign of knowing that the VA and your school start working together immediately to try and get rid of those for you. And you may wanna defer if you're gonna be taking out loans for a little bit and wait till it's all consolidated for it to be forgiven. Um, again, you can always talk to your vet rep at your institution to make sure that they're aware of it in their financial aid office. I also do strongly encourage any veteran who is looking at grad programs, doc programs, to uh, look at those additional funding pathways that are out there to include being a grad assistant, a TA, um, and quite a few different funding tracks um, within the different institutions in terms of scholarships and grants to continue your education. So um, even if you've exhausted your GI Bill, look at FAFSA and look at those other funding sources in addition to the loan forgiveness. Awesome. Um, so another one we just got, when applying for VRNE, employment through long-term services, what's the most common or best way to communicate that you need a master's degree? I've yet to meet with my VRC, but I'm afraid they may disqualify me because I already have a bachelor's. Yes, and that happens a lot um, where there's that concern of I have a degree, so they're probably going to put me on that more rapid track. Hey, you're educated and go, you know, you have either your experience and your education just hit the job market. What I always encourage veterans to do is be prepared at your first meeting. Bring in the job descriptions that you of the positions you're most interested in and highlight if they have masters required. At that point, you are not qualified for the job. You haven't met the essential requirements. So therefore you do need more education and training to reach that tier. If it's a master's preferred, then you're in a bit of a different situation and you do have to kind of create your case that while you do have your bachelor's, you feel like maybe the skills and knowledge that will be covered in a master's program will make you more you know, proficient in hitting the industry a little bit more prepared, or again, you're hoping to be more in a leadership role and therefore it would really help to have this master's level education. Um, but again, most jobs, if, if they're looking for a master's, it will say master's required. Um, so, you know, I always say, look at the job descriptions, print out as many of them as you can that have that requirement. Um, just so that you come in prepared saying, first off, I did my homework. I know why I'm asking this of you. And then the other piece is, again, it's not just, I need this degree for this job, but why am I going for this job in the first place? And so as you're doing this transition out, as you look at your service connected, maybe you are very skilled and ready to go but you did the more hands-on portion of the job. And now because of your service injury, you need to do the more sedentary part of the job. And in order to do that career pivot within industry, you actually need more education and training because those people have to have different knowledge. Maybe you need to get trained in some type of computer software. Again, maybe you need a full-blown different um, degree because everybody who's in this part of the uh, you know, industry has to have a master's. This isn't preferred, it's now required. So you, what you need to do is talk also not only talk about why do you want the degree, but why are you making these changes based on your disabilities and your functional impacts? I can't be the person on the floor managing anymore. I can't stand for that long, but I don't want to lose all this knowledge and time in the industry of logistics. And so I'd really like to be more on the, you know, behind the scenes side of doing the actual management and tracking of the systems. And therefore I need to be in the office side and I need this new education and training. 
So again, always tying it back to your functional impacts and your disability and why are you choosing to go this particular employment route and then education route. And again, if you have more questions, feel free to touch base and we can kind of hash it out before you meet with your VR counselor. See if we have any, um, a lot of the, cause I, I put a question box up on Instagram and we got tons of them and 90% are related to VR and E. So that's a very big thing that, um, our audience is obviously very interested in. So let me find a non VR and E real quick. Um, should I be accepted at the school? I want to attend before applying for post 9-11. So, wow, that is a really good question. Um, so typically, uh, you don't need to enact and deal with your post 9-11 until you know which institution you're going to. Like, you won't activate your benefit in terms of enrollment, obviously, until you're actually enrolled in the school. Um, but yes, if you're considering education, make sure you know if you're what you're qualified for in terms of your post 9-11. How many months of benefit are you going to have? Um, and I would reach out to the school as early as possible, these schools that you are interested in, um, to again, know who your point of contact at the institution would be for certifying of benefits. Um, make sure again, through the VA that you are all squared away with post 9-11 benefits. We have also, I've seen veterans who say, yeah, I'm gonna use my 9-11. And then things are not ready by the time the first semester kicks around and um, then you're paying out of pocket. So the earlier you can prepare yourself for knowing what amount of benefit you have, making sure all your ducks are in, in a row for the VA, and then also knowing who your points of contact are at the campus are critical for making a more seamless transition. Because again, the institution and the VA have to work together to certify and ensure that everything's there. Um, so give yourself, the institution and the VA, plenty of time to get all of that aligned. Makes sense. Um, hmm. Let's see how, so when you're applying for vr &E, how do you know you're eligible after getting a disability rating? So as long as you're 10% or above, you are eligible for vr &E. um, That program is for service-connected veterans. It is literally the benefit for service-connected vets. Um, so you are eligible. What ends up happening when you hear some vets saying, oh, I wasn't, I was, I wasn't eligible for it, is more probably a disconnect between the, one of the tracks they were put on and what they wanted as their outcome for the VRNE. There's also typically, and again, this depends on where you're located, but sometimes a priority bracket of, hey, you know, most severe, so higher ratings first, lower ratings later. This can depend on caseloads of the location and the VA you're going out of. So sometimes it does, they do prioritize, you know, your 70 to 80s before they deal with the 10 percenters. So just being aware of that, there may be some of that, of that lag thing. Um, and again, it all kind of depends office to office. But as long as you're a service-connected veteran at 10 percent or more, you are eligible for vr &E. The track you land on and the process in which you go through can be kind of different, again, based on demand of the VA. And then again, um, really how you're talking to your vr &E counselor. Because if you're only talking symptoms to them, they're like, okay, great, but I don't see where the significant barrier to employment is. And that's where you have to talk functional impacts. I am impacted directly by this chronic migraine where I can't look at a computer for more than 30 minutes at a time. I can't be in you know, this fluorescent lighting for more than an hour. Um, and therefore I need a job that allows me to maybe work from home to find a job that has, um, you know, a different setting than a standard office. Um, so you need to be able to talk again about those functional impacts and how you're changing environments or tasks to better suit your need at this time. And the, the phrase they like to use is exacerbate your symptoms. So make your symptoms worse. I'm trying to do this because I think it won't make my symptoms worse is kind of how you want to be talking to them. I, this will play to my strength. I can't sit for a long period of time. My old job, I was sitting a lot, so I need a job where I can move around or vice versa. I can't stand on the floor anymore, so I need to find that sedentary job. So knowing how to talk 
about those functional impacts is really the critical point when you talk about eligibility and where you're gonna probably land in those five tracks. Um, so are you able to apply for vr &E as you transition out? I will now receive my disability percentage until September, which is the ETS date, but I believe I will likely get more than 20%. You do need to have your rating. Um, that is because they, you have to be a service-connected veteran in order to qualify for the program. Um, again, depending on the region in which you're in, your priority case may change depending on your rating level. So if you're at 20, you think you're 20, and then you actually end up at like, I don't know, say 30 um, or above, you might actually move up in a priority category. So um, it doesn't hurt to kind of get in touch with the VA where you're going to be landing, get information on their vr &E program, perhaps get the application ready to go, make sure you have all the documentation and things you may be needing to submit to them. And then as soon as you get that rating, start um, your work with the program. They may accept stuff ahead of time. Again, depends on the volume of the office. Sometimes they'll say, sure, go ahead, give us your stuff now. And as soon as you have the rating, we'll, we'll click the button and you're good. Others will say, please don't bog us down. It will get lost. Wait till you have your rating. So do check in with them. So we had another question that was talking about switching from post 9-11 to vr &E, um, yes. matriculating this fall and waiting for their rating still. So what's, it's a question, how do I switch from post 9-11 to vr &E, So Yes. So if you're going to switch, um, first and foremost, you want to do that as soon as you can. Uh, you do want to use your vr &E Chapter 31 before post 9-11 whenever possible. The reason being is if you have any post 9-11 left, while you're using chapter 31, you still uh, rate a BAH pay, depending on, again, how many courses you're taking. Um, so you can get BAH under chapter 31 and post 9-11 as long as you have 9-11 left while you're using vr &E. To switch to um, vr &E rather than 9-11, again, that's where the VA, your certifying school, has to work together because you to notify your institution that you're changing the benefit you're using, you still need to get certified. Um, and then there needs to be that communication between those two offices in switching that benefit over. So first, always notify your institution, hey, I'm changing my benefit. And then you will have to provide um, that connection between the VA and your institution in terms of if there's a letter that your school needs or how they're going to do it, but you still get certified. Um, but it, it, it is, again, between those two offices, your certifying official and your VA that you are going through vr &E through. Perfect. So another few questions about vr &E. um, In terms of using at any university, and then it, another one was similar, but I'm asking if it will pay for expensive schools. Um, I, I won't throw out the names of the schools, but right. is there a cost limitation? Can you use it at any university? What restrictions might be there in terms of what they will and won't pay for? That again kind of comes down to how do you make your case? Um, some of that ties into is that program available at a state school? or a different school, yeah, it can be hard to make the case that they should pay X, Y, Z amount for a certain education. But the reality is too, you have the right to own your education. You are gonna get what you want out of every degree and every opportunity. And so at the same time, look at your yellow ribbon component, look at um, your, again, what are the, career trajectories out, out of each of these institutions. Yeah, you could pay for me to go to the state school, but their employment rate for people out of this program is really low. Rather, this one is really high. If my goal is employment, shouldn't I be going to the one that has the higher employment rate post-degree? So again, do your homework on what are the institutions. Justify, justify why you want that school. And again, look at those other pieces. Okay, yeah, you're only going to, vr is only going to cover XYZ amount, right? The benefit sometimes 
with GI Bill, you only get a certain amount, right? Otherwise you're coming out of pocket. Either way, that's why yellow ribbon schools exist. So it's that same entity of how am I going to close any potential gaps that might exist? So being aware of that. Um, the r &E should, in most cases, be able to cover a majority of what you need. But again, like post 9-11, the benefit is only so much. So being aware of how to close any potential gaps, again, looking at the financial aid of a lot of these institutions, some of these highly competitive schools have very generous endowments that also have really great financial aid departments. So when you look at how you're paying for your education, regardless if you're using 9-11 or Chapter 31, look at those other pieces of filing for financial aid using the yellow ribbon opportunities. And again, any scholarships or grants that are dedicated to veterans at every school, because many of them, again, have dedicated um, in their scholarship page, look for those opportunities to get that additional funding. So close the gap, whether it's VRNE or 9-11, using those other pieces. And when you, if you don't know, just always reach out to their financial aid department and say, how do people afford coming here? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, is there anything, um, how does VRNE work when transferring schools? It can get a little more complicated if you're transferring schools. Um, and this kind of depends on what type of transfer you're doing. Obviously, if you're attending a community college, which is a time-limited institution, that's pretty straightforward. Obviously, I can't get my bachelor's here. It doesn't do that. So um, that's usually a little more straightforward. And you say, okay, you are going to pay for, you know, basically a bachelor's level anyways. I'm going to do the first two here. And that's sometimes how people make things more affordable and more friendly with their VRME counselor. And then I'm going to transfer to this other school. And again, that's just transferring your benefit. You say, okay, I got my associates here and now I'm going to go finish my bachelor's at this school. And you'll just establish your services at the next institution with your VRNE counselor. If you're going from four-year to four-year, the same process occurs where you would need to transfer your benefit to the new institution. But that's also a conversation with your VRNE counselor about why you're leaving the school you were with and going to a new one when we talk about why are they paying for your education in the first place. So you just wanna be careful and think that out about how you're gonna to talk to them about why maybe the school wasn't at the right fit or did you change your career interest, things of that nature. They're gonna to wanna to know why are you transferring if you're going four year to four year. Um, it's, a little more, it's a little more difficult in the VRE, VRE setting for that it, than if you're going from community college to something else because that's an obvious transfer. Um, so just consider those points and how you're going to discuss them. Let's do one last call if anybody has questions. Otherwise, I think we're good to go. Yeah. Awesome. OK. okay. Well, thank <laughs> you so much, Hira. This was so much information. I am not um, an admissions expert. So I learned a ton and I hope everybody did as well. Um, we'll go ahead and share this and we look forward to working with you and Amherst and everybody in the future. Thank you all for listening today and reach out and when in doubt, reach out to your VA rep in your area. They'll be able to give you the most direct information in terms of knowing your VA system. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Have a great everybody. day.